Without any further ado, let me introduce Gail and Barry to the stage, please, from CPA Practice Advisor. Gail and Barry. <laughs> Hello and welcome to all of you. And a big thank you to Intuit and QuickBooks for allowing us to make these presentations here today. Um, this is, I believe, the sixth year of the Most Powerful Women in Accounting Award. Um, every year, well, I've been with the magazine for four years, editor-in-chief of CPA Practice Advisor. Every year that we've had these awards, someone has come to me and said, why do women get the awards? Why is it just women? And I, I kind of want to say, really? <laughs> you have to ask. But So I did a little research. And along with national and even global Women of the Year awards, state, local women awards, there are outstanding women in legal profession awards every year, medical, engineering, the list goes on and on. So it kind of begs the question, why not accounting too? Should they not be awarded also? So anyway, if that doesn't answer the question, I have another example that might help. When I started in accounting a few years ago, <laughs> um, I left college with a degree in journalism, and I decided to go back to school and study accounting. While I was doing that, I went to work for a small accounting firm, a local firm, that had, um, I think, about six to eight accountants in the firm. And also, it had a bookkeeping staff of uh, about a dozen or 15. All of the accountants were men. All of the bookkeepers were women, and we all worked in a big room, and all the men were on one side of the room, and there was this big gap, and then all the women were on the other side of the room. When I came, they put me with the men. It caused a bit of a ripple in the firm, as you can imagine. And so um, I just felt that at that point, there needed to be some role models, some way for these women on the other side of the room to know that they didn't have to stay on that side of the room forever unless they wanted to, but that there were ways in which they could achieve whatever definition they had of success in this profession. And women like the ones we're honoring today provide that level of role models uh, examples, mentors, leaders, people for these women on the other side of the room to look up to. Um, so I was having a conversation last week with one of the women who we're going to announce today, who is one of today's winners. And she, we were talking about what makes a winner. And that's another question I get. Well, who gets picked for these awards? And she said to me, which I thought was very profound, she said, have you ever watched American Idol? Okay, that may not sound like a profound question, but bear with me. So have you ever watched American Idol or America's Got Talent or one of the talent shows on television where people vote and there's always, you know, elimination and eventually a winner? And she said, have you ever noticed that the winner of American Idol isn't necessarily the best singer? And I thought about that for a minute and she said, think about it. The winner, everybody who gets there has got a voice. Everybody who gets to the stage can sing or do whatever their talent is. But the one who wins, ultimately, is the one with the complete package. It's not just the ability to be a great singer or performer, but it's also the heart and the soul. It's the passion. It's the love they bring to their job or their profession. It's the way they perform. It's the hard knocks. It's the way they've made their way through their career, gotten to where they are today. It's what they've put into it personally to make it to the point where they are chosen to be the winner. And most importantly, they're the ones, the winners, are the ones who ultimately step aside and applaud and encourage the one who's going up to the microphone next. And that's a, an incredibly significant sign of the kind of leadership that we're looking for in the winners of this award. And one other comment that this woman had for me 
last week. I see we're, we're already showing some of the winners. A surprise. <laughs> um, one other comment that this woman had last week was we were talking about leadership. And I raised the question, or the comment, that it seems to me there's a lot of leadership training these days. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but um, accounting firms have training for leaders. The AICPA has leadership academy. The state CPA societies have leadership programs. You can hire someone to come into your company and teach leadership skills. And it seems like, especially our younger generation, we're really teaching them a lot about leadership. And, and I asked, well, if everybody's learning how to be a leader, who's going to be left for them to lead? You know, it seemed like a good question. And she, and she said, oh, you know the answer to that, don't you? Everyone is his or her own leader in their life. And I thought that was pretty moving. So what I'd like to do for all of the leaders out here in the audience and in the profession, and for those women across the room who needed the role models, is introduce those women who have been selected as the winners this year for the most powerful women in accounting. And these women represent every facet of the profession that you can imagine. We have CPAs who are CEOs, partners in charge of their firms. We have consultants. We have educators. We have writers. We have bloggers. We have podcasters. We have video people. We have people who have made such a difference in the profession and continue to do so. And that's just the start because beyond that, they're making a difference in their community, they're making a difference in not-for-profit organizations that they work for. All of them, every one of them are mentors. It's an amazing group, and I think you'll find that it's a great group for us to celebrate. So, first of all, as you can imagine, a lot of these women are pretty busy, and so many of them are not able to accept their awards in person, but that doesn't mean we don't want to recognize them. So. When, we, when I start, I'm going to go through the list of the names of people who are not here, but I understand we're being like, streamed, so if they're out there watching, they'll hear their names, and um, see. so you'll get to see who all of the winners are today. We're going to start with those who are not present today, and I'll just read their names and their title, and if you like, we can just hold applause until the end and then give them an incredible round of applause when that is ready to occur. So. Here we go. These are the women who are winners but are not present today. We have Karen Abramson, who is CEO of Walters Kluwer Tax and Accounting Global Division. Joanne Berry, CAE, who is Executive Director of the New York Society of CPAs. We have Sharada Bansali, Co-Founder and Executive Vice President of Accountants World. Danielle Supkis cheek who is President of D. Supkis cheek PLLC. Gail Crosley who is president of Crosley & Company, Loretta Dune, CEO of the California Institute of CPAs and the California CPA Education Foundation, Lynn Doughty, chairman and CEO of KPMG US, Sarah Elliott, co-founder, principal of Intend to Lead, Kimberly Allison Taylor, chair of the AICPA Board of Directors, and may I just mention that it was Kimberly who had both of the stories I told about American Idol and, and you know who, you, who the leaders are. Kathy Engelbert, the CEO of Deloitte, LLP. Melissa Hooley, partner of employee benefits at Anton Collins and Mitchell. Melissa is also the chair of the AICPA's Women's Initiatives Committee. Beth Leonard, managing partner at Lurie, LLP. Amy Pitter, president and CEO of the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Society of CPAs. Sandra Wiley, President of Boomer Consulting. Jennifer Warawa, Executive Vice President, Partners, Accountants and Alliances at SAGE. And Jennifer Wilson, Partner, Co-Founder of Convergence Coaching, LLP. So let's have a great round of applause for all of these winners. Okay, and I'm also joined on stage by my publisher, Barry Strobel from CPA Practice Advisor Magazine. Barry's going to be passing out the awards as we name the people 
who are here in person to accept their awards. So our first winner is a managing member of a firm called Powerful Accounting. She was a former 40 under 40 in the accounting profession. She's a member of the interior, okay. <laughs> it's Don <Dawn> Brolin. <laughs> Hi. Hi, congratulations. So I'm not gonna be able to read all these details. Next is Ariana Campbell. And I'll let you see what they've done because I'm not going to be able to speak over all the applause for every person. So which, with each person who comes up, we've got bullet points of the, some of the highlights of their career. May I just add that as we're doing this live, the article about all of these women is going live on the CPA Practice Advisor website so you can read the details about every one of these women. Our next winner is Angie Grissom. Next is Stacy Kildall. Our next winner is Michelle Long. Next is Cece Morgan. Our next winner is Elizabeth Pittlecow. Next is Amy Vetter. And next is Jeannie Whitehouse. Okay, we're going to stand here for pictures for a second. <laughs> all right. Congratulations to all of these incredible women. Okay, a few of these women are going to remain on the stage with me, and we're going to have a brief fireside chat to talk about some of the issues that women in the profession are facing and some of the successes that these women have had. All right, and so I'm joined by Ariana Campbell and Angie Grissom and Cece Morgan. Welcome and thank you all for sitting here with me today. Thank you. Um, let's start out with something that men don't know. Okay. <laughs> if you could each describe, if you've had something like this, a gender-related challenge that you've had either personally or something that you've heard of in your career, and how was that issue resolved, and could there have been a better way to do things? Okay, we'll start right here with Ariana. Sure, so thank you so much, Gail. It's great, it's great to be here. It's really an honor also to be speaking in, in front of all of you. Um, one thing that I would start off by saying is that any issues, at least personally, that I've, I have experienced, it hasn't been intentional. I think it really comes from just, you know, need for additional communication and things like that. And one that may seem small or trivial is really as we're looking at how we're including females in the activities that we have and the entertainment that we're doing um, during events. So for example, I often get invited to golf. And I know that there may be a lot of ladies in the audience who golf. Can I hear it for the ladies who golf? Good. For me, I'm not actually one of those people, and I get <laughs> invited to events in our profession that center around that. Another thing that also comes up in a lot of topics is very sports-focused, where we do have times unintentionally, and I know that women have a variety of things that they're interested in, but sometimes we do have conversations that lead women out. So in those experiences, it's important to just speak up and share your knowledge as well and include yourself in the conversation or in the outings. Thank you. Angie? Great. I actually had a very similar response to that. Uh, one of the, the challenges that I hear from people that we work with and coach um, that are women is um, I feel left out because a lot of times there are boys clubs and established referrals and things like that in, um, in CPA firms and organizations and they're not sure how to really get invited to the table. 
And, um, and again, the, the way that we coach around that is just break down that barrier. Um, like Ariana mentioned, I, I don't think it's an intentional barrier. We all have our, our groups that we feel comfortable with. And um, I think that if everybody looks at opportunities for them to get to know people individually and, and ask for mentorship from other people within the firm or um, you know within certain groups, they ask to be introduced to referral sources or connections, things like that, that that's a great way to overcome that barrier. Excellent. Cece? Yeah, I'm going to share a story of um, someone else that I had a chance to meet with recently. Um, she's the mayor of Compton, California. Her name is Mayor Asia Brown, and she was the youngest elected mayor. Um, and when she had a lot of passion for Compton because she grew up there, and Compton at the time had very high homicide rates, a uh, very gang-related uh, situation, and, and unemployment up, up in the 19% range. And she was elected as mayor, but when she walked in to take office, she was met with an old-school um, city council that had no confidence in her, was not backing her, and was not giving her support. And, you know, I, when I listened to her story, she had two choices. She could try to fight that battle, but she didn't. She went down a different path that I thought was very creative. She got together with the leaders of the gangs in Compton, and she only accepted the leaders, and she brought them all together to understand what their problems were and why they were doing what they were doing. And she made a pact with them that she would bring jobs into the area and she would make it a safer area if they would stop the violence and get behind her. And in four years, she reduced the homicide rate by 87%. They were, they were at 100 deaths per year and right. went down to 87. And she reduced unemployment into the single digits. And I loved her story because she didn't let what was in front of her stop her, she found a different, a different way around it. Nice. All right, our next question is, what advantages have you found by being a woman in or being associated with the accounting profession? And we'll start with Angie. Sure. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that women naturally connect with people pretty easily. And um, in, in Rainmaker, which is the organization that I run, I have not had a, a really hard time connecting with our um, employees or, or even our clients because I think people f naturally feel like they can trust me and, and start a conversation. And I think um, sometimes women have that advantage over men because um, they come across as maybe a little less intimidating sometimes and like they really want to jump in there and help. So um, I, that's probably the biggest advantage that I can think of. Yeah, I'm going to build on yours because it's very similar. Um, I would say emotional intelligence and curiosity. And the team that I work with knows that we have something, we have a continuum where we have self on one side, other on the, uh, on the opposite end, where we say the closer you get to other, the more value you're going to provide. And I think there's a natural, in fact, it's statistically proven, tendency to be able to have a deeper degree of empathy, uh, see through people's eyes, feel through their hearts, and I think that actually makes us able to get very close to customers and to be um, excellent coaches, but I also think it's something we can teach. Definitely. Excellent. Ariana? Well, I would just add to that, that with all the qualities that both ladies listed, that it really does help women in the profession to be naturally good advisors and to build that trust and to bridge that gap. So I would really encourage uh, women to really, if I may use the term, lean into that and leverage that natural talent that you have to really help to be that advisor to your clients, leveraging the trust that you have with them. Excellent. All right, we're going to change gears just a little bit, and I'll start with Cece. I'd like to know what your thoughts are about what we can expect in the accounting profession in the next five to ten years. It's a great question. I, I think there's two things. One is I think the um, combination of what we talk a lot about, which is artificial intelligence, and humans will start to come together in a way that can deliver some very, very powerful benefits to, um, to small businesses and the self-employed, where artificial intelligence takes on the mundane, the high-volume routine tasks, which is what it's equipped to do, and humans continue to connect those seemingly disconnected components, chart new territories, bring those two things together, and I think that's what starts to create 
the trusted advisor of the future that can really make a difference in a small business or self-employed's life. Can we know that it's starting out already in the larger companies and larger firms, the use of artificial intelligence to do a lot of tasks, even in the accounting profession? When do you see that kind of trickling down and making its way into the smaller firms? You know, I can't absolutely make a, a co complete prediction, but you're, we've already got things going in, uh, into it in small business and in tax. And I think it's closer than five to ten years. I think we're in the three to five years. Okay. Ariana, how about you? Well, this is a question that we ponder a lot at the company that I work with, Boomer Consulting, uh, because we really want to help firms to answer this question. And while we don't know specifically what it's going to be, we do know that it starts with thinking big and not getting stuck with status quo thinking. You really need to challenge yourself. And one thing that we've been really focusing on is challenging our clients to solve problems that don't even exist yet. So that requires a different mindset. So whatever it is that's coming, it's gonna be important that we have the right mindset to be able to address that, and that involves thinking big. Okay. Angie? I think the, the two trends that are coming um, is certainly the move from compliance to advisor, and, and we're seeing that everywhere. We're seeing that worldwide. And um, I think the way that you can get prepared for that is to start looking at the companies that you deal with holistically. And sometimes accountants and CPAs like to only ask the questions that, where they know the answer to the question. And I think that um, that's a mistake. I think that what we have to do is we have to take on that position as the most trusted advisor because we are perfectly positioned to do that. And, um, you know, doctors and lawyers and other professionals, they're not looked at like that yet. We are. So it's, it's ours to take. And there are lots of different ways to do that. Um, the second trend I see is there is increased competition in terms of um, the, the clients, you know, that we're, we're trying to win, uh, the firms that we're competing against, and, of course, the, the staff. And we've, we've talked a lot about that. Um, I think that we're going to have to be innovative, and we are going to have to connect with our clients and connect with our teams to understand truly what is driving them to have a relationship with us. And you can never do enough of that. So I think the better, um, the better we are at connecting with our clients, the more competitive we're going to be, the better we are with connecting with um, the market, the more we'll be viewed as a trusted advisor. And, and I think that there's, there's a huge opportunity to win. Now, Angie, do you see this involving additional training? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think that we all have to be lifelong learners. Um, it, it's critical. We have to be lifelong learners. And I think that, um, to Ariana's point, I think you have to look out beyond what is happening. Um, uh, Ram Sharan wrote a book um, around the, I think it's called The Attacker's Advantage. And it talks about whatever industry you're working in, if you can start to research what's happening in other industries and start to look at what, how might that impact what we're doing in five years and 10 years, you can start to plan in your organization to get ahead of that and to be an advisor. So training and paying attention, um, but I think, Gail, the biggest thing is empowering people in your organization to look ahead and putting them in charge of that. Okay. And Cece, um, are there any trends that you see coming in the profession that are expected to be particularly driven by women? You know, I would go back to um, the point we were talking about where, where we see that women excel, which is this whole concept of you know, very strong empathy and the emotional IQ. I think um, we're going to move into a world that is much more collaborative, where we have networks and communities of people working together, some because we might be specialists in certain areas. And I think this is going to happen in both the virtual world and the physical world, where you can see that a small business, for example, can bring in their accountant as their trusted advisor, they can bring in their banker, they can bring in their lawyer, uh, and it'll be a very collaborative, very sharing environment 
enabled by technology and data. And I think that because of the nature of collaborating and the empathy that we carry, I think that's an area we could lead. Ariana, would you like to add to that? Well, I think they both summarized the question very well. I just, again, encourage people to use their strengths so that they're prepared to lead with that, and also to not let things like the trends that we've talked about with the technology, to wonder it's when it's going to happen, and be prepared so that you can make those connections and help your clients. Angie, anything else? I, I agree. OK. I agree. <laughs> um, I suspect every person in the room here has his or her own definition of success and what you're striving for, where you expect to go or hope to go in your life, or maybe just are thinking in the, at the lowest terms of what you might be able to do um, without even pinpointing on what that's going to look like 5, 10, 20 years from now. But each of you have already reached a certain level of success in your careers, which is why you're on the stage here today. So Ariana, let me start with you and tell me how you define success. I try to define success fairly simply. Um, for me, I ask the question, have I added value? Not from my point of view, but from others' point of view. So that starts with my family, uh, from my husband, and we have three kids. We have seven-year-old twins and a three-year-old. So that keeps us busy. But I want to make sure that I'm adding value at home, but also that when I'm at work, I'm adding value to our clients and to my team members, and I know that I've been successful if I've done that. But the most important part with knowing if you've added value is that you have to ask. You can't just assume. That helps to, to really build those connections by asking for those, that feedback and then looking way, for ways that you can be better because well, there are always things that we can do to improve. So really, have I added value? That's how I determine success. Excellent. Angie? When I think about success, I think success can be whatever you, you want it to be. And, and success for one person certainly looks different from an, uh, another person. Um, success would be what are you setting out to, to achieve and are you working towards achieving that? So for me, um, I have always been driven to uplift and empower people from the time I was a little girl. And so for me, am I building the people in my organization? Am I contributing to helping other people become the best versions of themselves that they can be through speaking or writing or curriculum development or consulting? Um, and I think every day you can find a way to have some semblance of success and it looks different. It's bigger some days than others, but, but I think it's important just to, to look, at, um, look at your day at the end of the day and, and think, how did I impact somebody today? Did I, did I meet my goal? Did I empower somebody today? So that, that's what it feels like to me. Cece? Yeah, you'll hear very similar themes here. And the first one I would say is, I don't think success is an end state. I think it's something that we're all constantly evolving towards. Um, and at least in the role that I'm in, I think it's primarily driving success through others. And you know, at the end of the day, if people have told you, um, it's did you leave your employees, did you leave your customers, did you leave your profession in a better place than it was, and did you set it up to be even more successful by those that will follow you? Excellent. Um, let's take that down one level to like the nuts and bolts of your day, a day in the life of each of you. Is there anything you do during your day where you reflect or where you think about the future, um, or you do something that leads to or adds to your quest for your definition of success. Ariana? Um, for me, I have to start off with my mornings getting grounded with some time for quiet and reflection and prayer as well, but then also making sure that my goals are front and center, not just something that's written in a book somewhere that you don't reference back to, because that's how you help to stay focused. And at Boomer Consulting, we actually um, are really focused on goal setting, uh, not only for our weekly goals, but we have quarterly goals as well as yearly goals, but you have to look at them daily. So that's an important part of my daily routine. Angie? I agree with that. I actually was introduced to a really great book called uh, The Miracle Morning, uh, for those of you that have heard about it, for, um, by Hal Elrod. And um, he talks about something called the life saver in the morning, and it's silence 
Um, so your, your meditation, your quiet time to really get you grounded. Um, affirmation, I can do it. I know I can do it, but that's, that's sometimes hard, but um, affirmation. Um, v is visualization. So this, this is actually really helpful. So visualize, you know what, I'm going to get out of bed. I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to do what I'm going to, you know, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do today and be successful and it's going to be a great day. Um, exercise, which that one's kind of hard in the morning for me, but I can do it um, sometimes. And then um, reading, which is, you know, a reading would be um, maybe you're reading, you know, verses or maybe you're reading an article, um, whatever, just to get you sort of motivated and the, the wheels turning and then scribing. So it's lifesavers um, and scribing would be just you, you know, jotting down some notes. So I, I don't live by that every day, but the lifesavers has been something that has really helped me to be intentional in the morning instead of just jumping up and grabbing coffee and guzzling coffee. It's more about, I'm here today. What is my goal today? I can do this. I'm intentional about this. And then giving myself that time and reflecting. That's been very helpful. Excellent. Cece? Yeah, those were great. And two that I would add is um, I do do a... Um, uh, an allocation of where I'm going to spend my time, and there's a portion of the, my time that I dedicate to external learning, whether it's groups that I belong to, whether it is speakers that I invite in for my entire team or boards that I sit on. But as it relates to my day, um, I'm actually quite predictable. Um, I'm very much a morning person. I get up and I do read first in the morning. I try to read things that um, I don't think about every day. I do work out every day. I'm not saying I like it, but I do work out every day. And the thing that's <laughs> unusual is I use that time to sort through things that might be bothering me um, so that by the time I'm going to start the day, I'm clean and, you know, fresh and ready to go. Excellent. Thank you all so much for your answers and your time. And let's have one more round of applause for all of today's winners. <laughs> <laughs>